Good evening. I promised we might shame them into decorating the studio. It's all hired. Never mind. Tonight we pay a visit to that scarecrow, Wurzel Gummidge, who's seeking his fortune on the streets of London. And we visit a hospital at the end of this year of the disabled person. A young girl tells us what it means to her. We also have a carol, a little Dickens, a look ahead to what's on. But first, the regional news from Roger Livingstone. Roger. Police have begun an investigation after a fire at a news agency in Salisbury early today. A two-foot stack of newspapers left outside the shop in St John Street was set alight. The flames destroyed the double doors at the entrance and the total cost of the damage has been put at £2,000. Staff at a firm at Storrington near Worthing faced an uncertain new year because of a fire which wrecked their premises last night. Consumer Products Limited, who make perfume, so they don't know when they'll be able to return to work. James Montgomery reports. As firemen sifted through the wreckage today, the company was still assessing the full extent of last night's damage, but the cost is thought to run to thousands of pounds. Possibly just as serious, the company have lost valuable documents and computer records of their customers. Last night's fire spread quickly because the factory contained inflammable perfume and a large number of aerosol cans. It took 70 firemen two hours to control the flames, and one fireman had to be taken to hospital with a gashed hand. The cause of the fire is still being investigated. The firm, meanwhile, are understood to be looking for a temporary new home. At Newbury, however, a firm which is in difficulty has won a massive order from the Soviet Union. Plenty is limited in Hambridge Road at Newbury will supply the Russians with equipment for 41 power stations. The order is worth £20 million, which the company say will keep them in work for at least 18 months, and they could be taking on more staff as a result. Two unions in Hampshire are concerned about social services in the county. They say that because of spending cuts, the county's homes are on the verge of collapse, and they're demanding that more money is spent on them next year. To reinforce their demands, the two unions, NUPI and the Transport Working Workers' Union, are launching a campaign in the new year. Police have appealed for witnesses to a road accident in the New Forest last night in which a ten-year-old girl was killed. Samantha Elliott from Poole was a passenger in a car which collided head-on with another vehicle on the A35 road at Markway Hill between Lyndhurst and Christchurch. The car was being driven by her grandfather who is in hospital with serious head and chest injuries. Her parents and younger brother were also travelling with him, but they escaped with minor injuries. The family were on their way home from a pantomime when the accident occurred. A distinguished Fleet Street writer from Alsford near Winchester has died at the age of 63. Patrick O'Donovan was the author of several books and a specialist correspondent for The Observer. He'd been ill for some time. Berkshire County Council have launched a scheme to help voluntary and community groups which need financial help. The scheme will provide materials for local projects to help them provide jobs for unemployed youngsters. They're offering £100,000 in all and groups who think they could benefit are asked to apply early in the new year. People in Sussex are being asked to show more understanding to the men who are trying to keep the roads clear from snow. A spokesman for the Gritter drivers said they'd been subjected to a lot of abuse over the clearing of roads on housing estates. He said that main roads had to take priority, although they tried to get round to the housing estates as often as was possible. Cross-channel ferry services between New Haven and Dieppe were brought to a standstill today because of a 24-hour strike by French dockers. They took the action in support of their demand for better pay and conditions. The next ferry to sail from New Haven will be on Saturday. Thieves who broke into a butcher shop in Early Road at Reading stole joints of beef, pork, lamb, gammon and turkey valued at £1,500. Police at Brighton played Father Christmas today after a thief stole toys due to be handed out at the party for mentally handicapped children. They were taken from a van parked outside the home of a nurse at Carlton Hill in Brighton. Detectives investigating the theft raised £60 among themselves to replace those presents. And finally, it's already been a happy Christmas for fit more than 50 turkeys which have been handed into the Wingshaven Bird Sanctuary in Sussex. The birds have been taken there in the past week by people who'd bred them for slaughter, slaughter rather, but didn't have the heart to kill them. Well, there's still some Christmas spirit left among those people at least. But now it's Cliff and the rest of Day by Day.
The latest news on the countrywide collection for the dependents of the Mosul lifeboat tragedy is the fund stands now at £601,000. Today, in Whitswell in Kent, the lifeboat was out, as were the Coast Guards and the rescue helicopters. They were on the street helping to swell that fund. David Haig was there for us. For the lifeboatmen and Coast Guards of East Kent, Christmas Eve was tinged with sadness. Today, they joined forces in a cavalcade to pay tribute to the eight crewmen of the Penn Lee lifeboat, who lost their lives at the weekend. Together, they hauled the Whitstable lifeboat through the busy main street of the town in a massive fundraising effort for the Cornish families hit by the tragedy. The boat was flanked by Coast Guard units from Margate, Hern Bay and Sheppey, while most of the 22 crew of the Whitstable boat collected cash from Christmas shoppers. A helicopter fly-past by the search and rescue unit from RAF Manston took place despite poor weather. And the public response was anything but cold. The collection raised £650, and the lifeboatmen plan to get more money from a charity football match on Boxing Day, and they intend to keep the fun going until January the 4th. David Haig reporting. Well, now let's start our Christmas Eve round. We begin with a visit to the Cambridge Theatre in London. That's where Wurzel Gummidge has gone from Scatterbrook Farm. Christopher Peacock went in search of the children's favourite scarecrow. What's Wurzel Gummidge doing for Christmas? Standing in the middle of a perishing coal field, I expect. Ah. Oh. Yeah, well, uh, that's what happens most times, because I've got to point the, the way for Santa. Because without them scarecrows pointing, he don't know which way to go home. Do you believe in, in Father Christmas? Of course I believe in him, you stupid blockhead. <laughs> Everybody believes in Santa Claus, and they? Does he bring you presents? No, I don't get nothing. I, the the, the, the titchy humans gave me something last And the crow man gave me something last year. But you're never I, very actually, good, we, are you? You're we never have a, good enough for presents. Eh? You're never good enough for presents. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm very good. I try sometimes. And I ain't, I ain't smelly. I'm on a dirty outside. I'm very clean inside. I'm glad I'm upwind of you, I can tell you that. <laughs> That's very nice, thank you very much indeed. Are you giving any presents to anybody special? Uh, what? Are you giving any presents to anybody this year? I ain't got no money. I don't get no wages. How do I give presents? I give, I, I find maybe something like a tin or a bit of string or something for people. What are you giving to Aunt Sally? My love. But she doesn't return it, does she? No, you ain't supposed to return things you get given. <laughs> so you're going to be out there in the snow? Well, I don't know, really. Like, I, it, it, on Christmas morning, you know, there's having a big, we're having a big party on the flim about Wurzel. Mm. And last year, that's, he got a lot of presents then, so maybe I'll be lucky and get something again this year. I don't know. Hope so. You're going to wish everybody a happy Christmas? Yes, please. I wish every, every, everybody very... Christmas. Not a liquid Christmas, a happy Christmas. We said li you liquid. Did. I said mer merrily Christmas. <laughs> Merry Merrily Christmas. happy Christmas to everybody. Not a liquid one, Mr. Mr. Pocock says. <laughs> yes, and he's waving, he's doing that again, so that means we're coming to the end. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> And Wurzel is at the Cambridge Theatre over the next two months. Now, sadly, there are children who will not be going to pantomimes or to shows as they will spend the Christmas in hospital. John Kane went along to Queen Alexandra Hospital in Portsmouth to talk with one of them. Harriet Wade is ten. Although she's spent a great deal of her life in hospital, this will be her first Christmas in bed. Harriet has brittle bones. It means she can't walk and she's endured countless operations. Does she mind not being able to run around like other children? I'd mind if I couldn't ride a bike. Otherwise, um, it doesn't make much difference. Do you ever wish that you could just yeah. jump off and run around? <laughs> yeah. What can you do? Most things. I'll go and see my um, friends and I play games in the playground. Uh, play chase and stuff. And, well, <laughs> I'll do most things. But you must always be scared that you might fall yeah. over. How much of your life have you spent in hospital? Mm, about a quarter of it. Really? Yeah. Do you really get fed up lying here? Well, I get a bit used to it and know how to entertain myself. Should I feel sorry for you? No. Why not? I mean, I, I feel... Well, uh... More privileged in some ways. In what way? Mm, um, at school I'm always first in everything and... 
and that, uh, well, I don't know really. But why else shouldn't I feel sorry for you? Mm, I don't know. Um, perhaps you think differently because you don't know what it's like. Do you find people are sympathetic to you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very. Does that embarrass you? Sometimes. Of course, 1981 was the year of the disabled. Do you think it did any good? No. Why not? Well, because there were all these parties and stuff for the disabled, and, and there was the disabled just getting integrated, and they weren't mixing with able-bodied people, which was, I thought, that was what it was for. You just want to be normal? Yeah. So how can you make yourself so-called normal? Mostly because going to a normal school and um, riding a bicycle still. Will you ever be able to walk? Ah, uh, not without support, I don't think. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't really think about it. Do you ever feel like giving up? No. So what's Christmas going to be like for you? Um, well, a bit boring, but, uh, well, I'll just make the most of it, I guess. I think you're going to have a good time in here, don't you? Mm, pretty good, yeah. Can I wish you a happy Christmas? Yeah. There you are. Happy Christmas. Right. <laughs> and a happy Christmas from us to Harriet and to everyone else that's in hospital. Well, apart from Father Christmas and people willing to help with the washing up, there are others much in demand at this time of the year. George Harland is one of them. He performs the works of Charles Dickens, which is why we asked him to join us in our Dover studio. George, welcome back uh, after your second visit to the States. How did it go? Well, it went marvellously well. I was playing schools mainly in the Chicago area, and uh, unfortunately I couldn't do any Philadelphia schools this time because the, um, the teachers were on strike. <laughs> I did some last time I was there. But you had an unusual experience, didn't you? You went to the Philadelphia Free Library. Tell us about that. That's right. Well, in the, free in the rare books department of the Free Library, I have this fantastic room. A man called Elkins bequeathed the whole of his library, and he was a collector of rare editions. Uh, including all the bookshelves, the panelling, the furniture, the whole lot. And they've reassembled it in the Philadelphia Free Library, put in artificial windows with a little back cloth behind them and lit them so that it looks like the scene that he looked out on. Mm. And uh, they've got a lot of Dickens manuscripts and memorabilia there. We've got a desk that he used and... Uh, Which is like this materials. one, presumably, was it? Uh, no, 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 this was an ordinary writing desk. This was, this was his recital desk that he designed for his tours. And um, it's a, a most marvellous atmosphere. And we held a special recital there in that room. Did the Americans sort of make a gimmick of you? Because I, being what they're like, I would imagine they sort of have a, you know, Dickens wimpy bar or something. Yeah, with George well, doing his, <laughs> his recitals. They have a they have a Dickens Inn. Uh, they have one in London as well, St Catherine's Dock, and uh, they organised a, a special dinner after the Elkins recital for those that wanted to go. Uh, to meet Charles Dickens, and I had to go along in full regalia, moustache and all, eat my dinner, <laughs> wearing a moustache. Which is a stick on moustache. A stick on moustache. Those who don't know. Yes. And um, people you know, wanted to meet me to shake hands and all the rest of it. And then after the dinner, I did, um, I did a short recital. Quite an experience, I should say. Quite think. an experience. It's, you... it's very interesting, because I'm, I'm doing one in Folkestone. Are you? Christmas. The oh, at the pool, so maybe. we'll have a chance to see it. Yeah. Good. Will you do a recital for us now? What are you going to do? Well, I usually do about two hours, but um, <laughs> this is a little short piece from Pickwick Papers uh, from Bob Sawyer's party. It's a thing that Dickens himself used to do. This is a tiny extract called The Necklace. Jack Hopkins arrived late for Bob Sawyer's party and was frightfully apologetic. Uh, terribly sorry, old man. Been detained at Bart's. Interesting case came in. Boy swallowed a necklace. Uh, not all at once, you know. <laughs> no, way was this? Child's parents, poor people. Uh, child's sister bought herself a necklace, ordinary sort of necklace, large black wooden beads. Child cribbed necklace, hid necklace, played with necklace, cut string of necklace. Swallowed bead of necklace, thought it capital fun. Next day went back, swallowed another bead. Day after that, another bead. And the day after that, two beads, and so on. Until by the end of the week, it got through the whole necklace, five and twenty beads in all. Sister, never treated herself to much finery, looked for necklace, cried hours out she couldn't find necklace. A few days later, family at dinner. A child not hungry, playing round on the floor. 
Suddenly, family heard a devil of a noise, like a small hailstorm. Don't you do that, said the father. I ain't doing nothing, said the child. Well, don't do it again, said the father. Silence. Later, noise even worse than ever. If you don't mind what I say, said the father, you'll be off to bed in less than a pig's whisker. And he shook the child to make him obedient. Well, beads in the boy's stomach rattled with the shaking. Why, bless my soul, said the father. It's in the child. He's got the croup in the wrong place. No, I haven't, father, said the child. It's the necklace. I swallowed it. So father picked up boy, rushed with him to the hospital, beads in the boy's stomach rattling all the while with the jolting, people looking up in the air and down in the cellars to see where the noise was coming from. He's in the hospital now. He makes such a devil of noise when he walks about that we're obliged to cover him up in a night watchman's coat in case he wakes up the other patients. Moral, don't eat the beads. But you wouldn't be daft enough for that, would you? Sam Weller once used the phrase, dumb as a drum with a hole in it, which is a pretty accurate description of my musical talents. I don't know about yours. However, to fill in for those of us who like a seasonal tune, here to oblige the Westgate School Winchester Percussion Band. Boom. Now, looking ahead to what goes on in the next few days, first with David Bowman, but a south spot. What goes on? What a cracker, David. Uh, well, I'll pull your cracker in a minute, Cliff, if I may. But I own. guess that after all that uh, Christmas overeating and drinking, many of us will need to get out into the fresh air to work off some of those extra calories. But before we look at these sporting fixtures and talk to one of the South's Christmas Day cricketers, this morning down at Josh Gifford's staple in Findon, a rather special presentation took place. On the receiving end were jockey Bob Champion and that wonderful horse Alden Eighty. And together, of course, they won this year's Grand National after both of them had triumphed over incredible adversity. Two pretty young ladies from a national brewery were there also to make the presentation, and they were certainly refreshing the parts that others can't reach. But whatever the weather, it's going to be a cricketing Christmas for Noel Bennett from Brighton. Now, he celebrates his 72nd birthday tomorrow by leading his own team against a team called the Yule Logs in the traditional match down at Preston Park in Brighton. Derek Williamson's been along to meet the remarkable Mr. Bennett. Noel, yes. it's a fairly eccentric thing to do on Christmas Day. Wouldn't you rather be sitting down to a Christmas dinner? Quite frankly, no. I like playing cricket under any circumstances at any time. And I'm only too delighted that we've got such wintry conditions in great contrast to India where they're playing under the scorching sun. Have you ever had to cancel a match because of bad weather? In the whole of the 40 years it has only been cancelled on four occasions and that is when there has been torrential rain. This is a serious game and we don't play under ridiculous conditions. But I mean, in the course of 40 years, on only four occasions has the game not been played, and we have played on a snow-covered pitch when the stumps have had to be hammered in. How do you think the pitch is going to play? Well, I think that underneath the ground is rock hard, and there might be some excited moments when some of the faster bowlers come on. But we'll have to condition it so that it's not dangerous and use the right pace bowlers. But I certainly think that it will play some weird tricks under these circumstances. Not too hard, please, Noel. 
Great stuff, that. And that match starts at 10 o'clock tomorrow at Preston Park in Brighton. But many of Boxing Day's football matches could be in danger. Already off, of course, is Saints game at Aston Villa. And Brighton's match at Arsenal is doubtful too. But in Division 3, Gillingham travel to Fulham. Reading play at Oxford. Portsmouth play Bristol Rovers at Fratton Park. And Southend, they're at home to Millwall. That, by the way, kick off at uh, half past 11 on Saturday morning. And finally, in Division 4, all the shot there at home to Northampton, and AFC Bournemouth entertain Colchester. That's all on Boxing Day. To all of them and all of you, a very happy Christmas. I liked his bit about not playing in ridiculous conditions. Great, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, now for a little gentler exercise. We join Steve Harris in Worthing, where tea dancing is an attraction. It's going to catch on anywhere in the South. It just had to be Worthing. An elegant, if slightly fading backwater, with more than its fair share of middle-aged and middle-class folk yearning to recapture and rekindle a delightful part of their past. And what more perfect setting for such an event than the Denton Lounge, situated at the foot of the town's Art Deco Pier. The band is ready to strike up, and the great tea dance revival is about to take another step forward. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Love to see you all here again at the Denton Lounge for an afternoon tea dancing. We hope you're all going to enjoy yourself. In the meantime, we're going ahead dancing with a cha-cha-cha, which will be tea for two. Picture me upon your knee. Tea for two and two for tea. The tea dance reached its peak in the 20s when it was a regular feature of many major dance halls like the Regal Marble Arch, Lions Corner House in the Strand and the Café de Paris where dances are held to this day. Tea dances were still going strong in the 50s and early 60s and it was then that former Chelsea and Millwall outside right Roy Dew got hooked on the habit and it was his enthusiasm which revived them in Worthing. After we finished training uh, on a Tuesday or a Thursday morning we used to uh, get changed quickly and go to a tea dance, either the, uh, the uh, Empire Lister Square or the Hammersmith Pally. So this was the thing that, that footballers used to do in those days? Well, a lot of us did, yes. If we're not doing that, we were going away to play snooker. But the majority of the time, it was the tea dances. What was the attraction of the tea dance? Well, um, it, was, it was good, really, to help you with your uh, legs and muscles and what have you dancing. But uh, we liked the big bands in those days, and uh, you met plenty of people and actually a lot of our fans were dancing there as well and we used to have wonderful afternoons. Vocalist and band leader Shirley Weston who used to sing with the Ken McIntosh band remembers the tea dances with affection and has thrown herself into the revival with every enthusiasm. There's people who come in for a cup of tea and a dance and just to meet the friends. There's also some people that come from the local dancing school to practice their dancing, their ballroom dancing, to the live music, which is a change from records. And that's another point. I think people are a little bit fed up with discos, records, everywhere they go, everything's to records. And live music these days is, um, you know, it seems to be coming back more. Oh, there's an idea for you. Now John Kane comes up with some bright and some not so bright ideas of how you can fill in any blank moments in the void of the holiday yawning in need of filling. John. Have you got a moment to think about what to do after Christmas? If you have, I've got some ideas with this special Christmas weekend. It seems Boxing Day brings out the craziness in people. It's a 36th Pag and Pram race, the oldest pram race in the country. Contestants have to walk over three miles with compulsory stops at three pubs. It all starts at 11 a.m. opposite the old mill My Timber, and Dave Bobin will be there. And at the same time, the Newick Pram Race will be trundling its merry way. And on the bank holiday Monday, there'll be a pram race around Pool Park cycle track, again starting at 11 o'clock. Back on Saturday, Muddiford and District Men's Club, in association with the RNLI, are staging their annual bedstead and pram race on Mudderfield Quay at 11. Obviously, there's a whole host of pantomimes starting after Christmas. There are far too many in the South to mention, so check your local press for details. Tomorrow, Christmas Day, the Bournemouth Spartans hold their Christmas swim. They'll be shivering from Boscombe Bathing Station at 11 a.m. Meanwhile, over in Brighton, a vet will be seeing how long he can stay in the water. Bob Davison is doing it all for charity, and you can find him immersed somewhere between the Palace Pier and the Marina. Now, how about an open-air dance on Saturday? Gordon Ryder and his orchestra will be doing their thing, as they've been doing for the last 30 years, at the Eastbourne Grandstand from 11 o'clock. On Monday, Salisbury Motorcycle Club are holding a hangover grass track meeting at Shrewton, which is two miles from Stonehenge. It all starts at half past 11. 
Among the many bizarre fancy dress charity football matches are two on Sunday. One is at half past seven at Park Lane Recreation Grand Ferrum, and the other kicks off at 11 at Woodside Road Football Club Worthing. And still on Sunday, there's banger racing at Matcham's Park Stadium Ringwood. First race is at three. Here's a really unusual one, and I'm not too sure what goes on. There's a mock hunt which starts at 11 a.m. outside the Duke of Kent Cranbrook on Monday. It's an eight-mile course with 16 jumps. And finally, on Boxing Day, there'll be dancing in the village of Luce when Morris men will be prancing through the town. There's also a traditional mummers play, and it's all from 11 a.m. That's it from weekend. Have a great Christmas. In the new year, I'm off to work in Birmingham, so look after them all down here for me, won't you? Back to Cliff. Somebody will, John. And now, here's another Christmas cracker for you, uh, uh, Trevor. Thank you. The, week, the weather, the next few days, are going to be big changes. Uh, tomorrow, I think there'll be practically no snow fall t falling at all in southern England and very little anywhere else in the British Isles. On Saturday, a thaw will start to set in. The things are going to change completely. The wind's going to become southwesterly. Temperatures will rise on Saturday, but this may well bring us some rain as well. So it'll be perhaps some rain on Saturday. And Sunday and Monday, too, the thaw continuing. So a lot of the snow will be gone by Monday. And most pitches, I think, in the south will be playable for football and rugby on Monday. And some might well be playable on Saturday as well. What's happening? These cold northerly winds at last are giving way. We've had them for oh, over a fortnight. They're moving away eastwards, and mild air from the Atlantic will spread in over the next few days. That'll make all the difference. If you're traveling away from the south during the tonight and tomorrow, the main hazard, there will there'll be little in the way of falling snow, the main hazard will be freezing fog patches which are forming in the Midlands and East Wales and Northern England and South Scotland. They'll clear slowly tomorrow. Here's the forecast chart for noon tomorrow. Most of the British Isles will have uh, a dry day and slow thaw starting to get into the west. And rain will get into Ireland during the course of the afternoon, preceded in some places by some snow, and that rain getting into western Scotland during the evening. Sea crossing will be fairly smooth. Now, tonight in the south, the lowest temperature will be about minus 3 degrees centigrade. It will be a very frosty night, and some fog patches will form. The best temperature tomorrow will be about 2 degrees centigrade, but during the evening, temperatures may go up higher than that and get the thaw really started. Uh, tonight, there'll be uh, some more snow at times in Essex and Kent and East Sussex, but not very much, and this will gradually die away. Tomorrow, a dry day throughout the region, and probably some sunshine at times during the day. So, not too bad a day, but there will be a few fog patches early in the morning, which will have to clear before the sun comes out. And that's all back to Cliff. Thank you, Trevor. All that remains is me to wish you all a very happy and peaceful Christmas. To thank so many of you for sending us cards by the van load, and we bid you farewell tonight with the help of the choir who sang for the Queen. They're from Seaford College, just outside Petworth. Happy Christmas from us all. Goodbye. <laughs>